the sentiment always was the GOAT, the greatest player on the court, failure when it came to being an owner. Now, is it really a failure if you made all this money when you sell the team? Again, when he bought in 2010, it was the Charlotte Bobcats. It says in the New York Times and everything I'm reading that he bought, and Nick Cope, correct me if I'm wrong, he bought in 2010 for $275 million. Either way, it was in the million. Yeah, so we're talking a couple hundred million, million, which, by the way, is a ton of money. But ton a, of co- money. a couple hundred million dollars. But dude, millions and billions are way different, okay? So he had a 13-year run as majority owner. He bought in 2010, $275 million. It is now valued at $3 billion. So how do you measure this greatness, this sort of success? This is why... This is not a failure. Do you measure this it is in why, wins or in money? No, this is why millionaire and billionaires want to invest in franchises. You're never going to invest in a sports franchise and be like, man, I lost money. My favorite story of all time, and I, you know me, I'm a Mets fan. I don't like the Yankees, but I am fascinated by the fact that the Steinbrenners bought the New York Yankees. Does anyone want to take a guess? I don't want to, you know, it's a silly game, but what do you think the Steinbrenners bought the Yankees for? Oh, I remember this. Yeah. It, it, it was something like $60 million or something like that. It's going to disgust you even more. I think it's lower than oh, that, $15 right? million? $10 million. Oh, wow, yes. oh, man. No. George Steinbrenner oh, bought the Yankees in the 70s for $10 million and... As I look it up now, the Yankees are worth over seven billion dollars. That's crazy. That is like that's not. We forget how much a billion dollars is. It's not like it's it's a hundred. It's a thousand million dollars. Yeah, it's, right? I mean, it's a you, big difference. Yeah. So my question here is: Do you have to win to be considered a, a, a success as an owner, or do you have to just make your profits? I get it. As an individual, as or, an individual. or according to the fans, it's that's your two that's your two layer thing. As an individual, Michael Jordan, a oh, fine investment. A couple hundred million dollars, he could cash out that stake for billions? Yeah, genius move. But Yeah, but guess what? As a fan, he right? was in control as a player. He won as a player. As an owner, it's a different game. And I, I consider him winning because it's the game of business. Can you say that again? Charlie Sheen style? It is old school, right? Winning. Is it old enough where it's retro now? Of Tiger course. blood. Winning. <laughs> I'm going to bring it back. <laughs> Winning. Think about it, guys, because Michael <laughs> Jordan, for as great as he is and for as much as everybody loves him, he does get a lot of criticism for what he did with the Charlotte Hornets, Charlotte yeah. Bobcats when he bought them. Now, when you've seen what he's going to get, did he really fail? Does that change your perspective a little uh, again, bit? Again, two layers. As an individual investor... Genius. As and by the way, isn't that the game he's essentially playing when he becomes owner? Yeah, but when you're competitive, Michael Jordan and the face of the NBA, the greatest player of all time. That's just the that's just the bonus. No, but I'm saying like if you would have won, that would have been a bonus. All right, I'm. I'll give you an analogy with your boy Jeets. Derek Jeter, for all the winning culture he had as a Yankee in pinstripes, when he went to the Marlins front office, when they were spending no money. Derek Jeter started to become tied to the idea of like, yeah, yeah, great player, much like a Jordan, you know, not really a great executive. And you can say the same about Magic Johnson as far as some of his non-playing ventures, right? Magic Johnson wasn't a great coach or a late-night host. Sometimes you got to, you know, just because you were dominant in one part of your career doesn't mean you're dominant in others. But if you're going to be Michael Jordan, you don't think the fan base and the players and everyone are going to think that you're going to try to bring your winning culture to an organization. The Charlotte Bobcats yeah, slash like, Hornets have right, done well, nothing well, to you're win. You're going to bring up my, uh, you know, one of my favorite players of all time, Derek Jeter. He left that organization way better than he found it. You know, sometimes says these says everybody says everybody they says won, Jeter. The, the says Marlins have won. There. The Marlins have won there, two World Series. The Marlins have won two World Series, and have done nothing since Jeter got there. It's not like the, the Marlins had their success when he was there. That's your opinion. The facts state otherwise. You know, you could find clips of Jeter talking about it. You find clips of everybody talking about what he did that was a major success for the organization. Now, again, we'll take your feedback and phone calls. <laughs> In four years under Jeter, 
Yeah, you're talking about The Marlins about went. We're the talking Mar- about where he left the franchise and what they built as an organization. I'm not quite sure what that means. Because there's a back office, there's a front, there's there's everything that's going on behind the scenes, and then there's the product they're putting out on the field. As an organization, he left it in better hands. He he's talked about it a bunch of times. The team went two eighteen and three twenty seven while Jeter was on you know, in, in the front office. That's significantly under five hundred. Two eighteen and three twenty seven over four seasons? Depends how you look at these things. Like I said, that's an average. Point, of, that's an average of fifty. You're playing, five wins. That's an average of fifty-four wins a year. The guys on the field are playing a game. The guys in the front offices are playing business, and I think Jordan was playing business and won when his team is valued now at three billion dollars. I don't look at that as a failure at all. I laugh at anybody that thinks it is. I, not a failure as a businessman and an individual. Well, that's but, what. That's the game he's playing now. He's done playing basketball. He's done winning. He's in the game. He did win. It's worth $3 billion. All right, to your phone calls now, we'll start with Paul. I thought it was Paul Wall on the stage. I was like, who is this? Is this guy wearing a grill? Uh, no, but we got Paul on the phone from West Virginia. Hey, Paul. Paul. Uh, Michael Jordan as an owner. Can you look at it as successful or not? The guy's going to make billions, but the team stunk under his reign. It's a, it's a success to me. Like, complete Same. 100% success. Same because he's playing a different that- game. Yeah, I, I mean, no, yeah, you're playing a different game, one from player to ownership. It's completely different, but it has nothing to do with that. Like, you look at him as being one of the most successful, if not the most successful, greatest player of all time. And now look at what he's done for his family. Like, we always have that conversation about generational wealth, and this is yeah. multi generational wealth. I mean, for the rest of the Jordan legacy, whoever carries that name and beyond. They're going to be set up like you, you. You get that three billion, you put it up in a trust, and forever and ever. You, yeah, you're we're good. not talking. You're right, yo, know, Paul. You're not talking kids and grandkids. You're talking twenty generations of Jordans. What was the stat we saw in the movie Air that every year Michael Jordan makes four hundred million dollars off of just the Jordan brand alone with doing like like uh, what do you call it passive income when you don't really have to do much? Four hundred million dollars a How year. How do we get some of that passive income in addition to? the business decisions he makes. So Michael Jordan, you could say, what a businessman, the greatest NBA player of all time. But, you know, I think you would expect more from him as an owner that wanted to put a winning product out there. I just don't know if Charlotte could have ever lured those people. Didn't you think in the beginning, Danny, that Michael Jordan being part of a team ownership would have players want to play for him because they admired him? I think we all did. And the fact that he is such a competitor and he's so laser focused when it comes to winning championships that I assumed it would carry on as an owner, not just as a player. A dude that took everything, uh, quote, personal in the documentary. Yeah, right? just you, listen, go back and listen to his Hall of Fame speech. You rubbed that dude the wrong way and you were marked for death, essentially. Like, you like. The stories go on and on. Uh, some guy, you know, busted Jordan's chops in the fourth quarter saying, hey, not a good game, Mike. Mike puts up 20 in the fourth and they win. Well, I, I think he's still winning with this new deal. Agreed, Kavino. Again, but we're if saying he just that, joined us, he mm. bought in 2010 for $275 million, is valued now at $3 billion. Again, sh- uh, selling his majority stake as the Charlotte Hornets owner. But when it comes to overall greatness, hang tight because I'm not sure it's Michael Jordan. I think there's a another goat that doesn't get the credit he deserves, and I'll explain in a few minutes. But back to your phone calls, eight seven seven ninety nine on Fox. Spot, is this a compliment or not? Because you're the Seinfeld expert. I feel like Spot knows every Seinfeld reference there is. Well, I know a lot. There's an article now. This is from your hometown, Covino, New Jersey. Okay, NewJersey.com. This is an article from a couple of years. Ago. Actually, no, from last month. Yankees great Derek Jeter was the, quote, George Costanza as Marlin CEO, ex-team executive, say. Was he, would that insinuate, was Costanza good or bad, Spock? Because I feel, I feel like, like that's negative. Uh, yeah, right? I no mean, one wants to be the George Costanza. But they're saying, turns out nearly everybody curbed their enthusiasm for the captain as a baseball executive. Former Florida Marlins executive David Sampson became the latest to mock Jeter yeah, what's so, that guy ever done? Yeah, but this is your love for Jeter no, talking. It's not. It's it's things I know how he considers it, and I believe that he left it in a in a way where he was very proud of what he had accomplished there. Again, there's more to the organization and what's out there on the field. 
if they can't produce, that's not not, not all a reflection on on what's going on as far as the business is concerned. Um, but if Derek Jeter was again, he's playing a different game. Okay, Alex in Florida. What's up, Alex? You're on the show, Cavino and Rich. What's going on, guys? Love the show. Oh, okay, so man. my my example of this would be John Elway. Yep. Knowing your lane when you're a player, regardless of what lane you're in, knowing your lane and being successful in your lane, but sometimes those, those lanes don't cross over. You never have heard of Elway getting interfering with coaching stuff or plays that he let John Lynch or whoever his GM was handle the things that he handled, and he handled it on his level. And whether you agree Denver was successful or is successful now, whatever it is, Elway has been successful in his role from from quarterback to now executive to where he's at. And I think we expect, as a fan, we want that same tenacity and and passion in the executive room, but that's a whole different side of that. We don't even see that. Yeah. The executive side of things way different. So again, a great argument because you could you could really see both sides. Mm-hmm. You could be effective. Michael Jordan's making billions of dollars. Derek Jeter, Kavino could argue that behind the scenes he he left things in a better structure than before. He said behind the scenes that organization was in shambles. He was very proud of what he was able to accomplish while he was there, putting it in the right direction. Ah, well, that's a fair as statement. An organization. But I think much like we saw Elway build the winner as an executive in Denver. It's very strange to see guys like Derek Cheater and Michael Jordan, who in our eyes are two of the biggest winners of the last 25, 30 years of sports, odd to just see them yeah, you know, on the, on, on the, the field anymore. Man. I know, but it's odd to see them even associated with such a bunk product like the Marlins or Charlotte. But you're, how could it be bunk if you're making billions? Because you can make billions of dollars in any but sports again, franchise. Say it one more time, that's the business they're in now. That's the game they're playing. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear that. It's not story. wins, losses. It's dollars. And they're winning. And again, like like Rich did say, though, you can see both sides. Yeah. Chime in at Covino and Rich. Now, congrats to Jordan. That's big news. But I want everyone to think about this for a minute. I saw a clip yesterday, and it made me think. Let's talk about overall greatness. We're not going to have that same old tired, stale-ass... <gasps> Jordan, overall LeBron. Great, overall greatness, uh, the 80s. Hillbilly Jim had great overalls in that's, the uh, in the 80s wrestling. Overall greatness, Overall greatness. For overall sure. greatness uh, Farmer Fran. O- overall greatness, I'd have to say Kid and Play had great overalls. Oh, uh, Criss one, Cross. One, I'm sorry, Criss Cross. Did I say Kid and Play? Criss Cross. I mean, I'm sure Kid and yeah, Play, kid and play some had some overalls, overalls too. too. Overall greatness, Hillbilly Jim's the number one answer. You're right. <laughs> but I get what you Overall greatness. All right. Okay. Now, of course... You could debate Jordan, LeBron, all you want, right? My, my buddy had good you know, little <laughs> action. Didn't he have overalls on spot? My buddy he did. did wear overalls. Yeah. <laughs> he did a nice hat. So did Chucky, hat. obviously. Chucky, yeah, Chucky great overall game. Um, but when you think about overall greatness in sports, I think there's a winner that isn't LeBron or Michael Jordan. Overall greatness in sports. Now, when I say overall greatness, I mean the guy won on the court. He won in life. He won in business. He wins with charisma. Like, this guy just wins overall. So, yeah, you could say Jordan's the GOAT in basketball, right? What I'm about to say might be the answer to he's the all-around GOAT in life. Who's the sports GOAT of life? The sports GOAT of life. It trumps all the other debates. Trumps. And I can make a pretty good argument that that person is. Are you ready for it? He's our national treasure, everybody. Shaquille O'Neal. And... Something so stupid made me think about this, but I was just doing the ball scroll. I was on the ball doing the scroll, Instagram, and I saw a clip of Shaq rapping. Now, if you grew up an uh, 80s, 90s kid like me, you remember when he was doing his foo schnickens and what's up, Doc, can we rock? And you remember he rapped and he would do that, and that was part of his character and who he was. But I saw him doing a remix to a Machine Gun Kelly song called Paper Cuts, and he put his Shaq twist on it. He's like, yeah, I'm just doing a remix of my favorite, one of my favorite rappers. One of his favorite rappers. Not a bad Shaq, by the way. And and it was so good. But I'm like, look at Shaq doing Shaq-type things. Things that we take for granted. Things that all these other greats and goats, we never see that side of them. Well, uh, take a listen to Shaq. MGK. MGK. <laughs> you can have this one for free. <laughs> Hookah pipe. Smoke it up. Don't inhale. Just blow it up, count every 
every day I got paper cuts Worship the green Like God we trust I don't think we need to hear more than that Other than, oh he sings there Yes we do, oh, oh, he cool. sings oh. Yeah <laughs> Of Shaquille O'Neal, right? Shaq singing. Okay. I started thinking about the Shaquille O'Neal we knew growing up, how personable he is, how marketable he is. The businessman, you know, this guy owns so many different franchises and has his hand in everything. He's still involved in basketball. We're still watching him all the time. His camaraderie and chemistry with Barkley right. as an announcer. Dude, I his, saw, his charity. I, I saw a story where Shaq, it was days ago where he saw a family in need and he bought him a washer dryer at Home Depot. Dude, you I see saw him too. buying a laptops for kids who can't afford them. The shoes, his, he's given like millions and billions of sneakers out and like the guy does so much for the community, for people, for jobs. Like, he adds to the economy, and he has probably the best personality of all these other superstars that we talk about. Why don't we give Shaquille O'Neal that type of credit? It's always the same Jordan-LeBron conversation when, when you really think about maybe overall greatness goes to the most likable of all, Shaquille O'Neal. Not only the charity. Not only helping people in need, not only his hilarious rapping and singing skills, his his career, his career on the court, his career with. So I'm saying when you combine them all, Barkley and the team, you know, on TNT. When you look at what he spent, what he talks about with his kids, right? He always puts a good message as far as parenting goes. I feel like he's a good dad too. It's Father's Day weekend. Are we overrating? What Shaq brings to the table, I say no. Danny, you're a Lakers guy, so he probably means a little something special to you as well. But is Shaq the winner in like sports life? When you combine all those all things. All those things? I think he is. I mean, I've always been a huge Shaq fan, and when he left the Lakers, it, it was a sad day for Los Angeles. Like, you felt it across all the streets here in Southern California. All the Laker fans were really upset about it because he and Kobe should have at least won one more championship together. But, yeah, he was known to hook up family after family in the L.A. area when he was here. And then he would go back to Orlando and hook up people on the East Coast. He was all over the place with his charity work and his music. I got to interact with him because I was programming a hip-hop station in the L.A. area, and he had a big hit with DJ Quick called Straight Playing. And he came to our radio station, and he did a meet and greet with the listeners. Dude. And so you had all these Laker fans lined up outside the radio station just to get a glimpse of him, a picture. And he stayed two hours after the event was supposed to be over. And I'll never forget that because he took a picture with every last person that showed up. And how about, dude, you just made me think of something else, though, Danny G. Remember when he came out? I forget what it was for, but he was dancing with the Jabberwockies and everything. Oh, that's right. Uh, <laughs> NBA All-Star. Yeah, uh, it was, it was an All-Star weekend. It was a big event. I remember it. that mask barely fit his face, <laughs> and he's doing the dances. But he's doing all these things that we don't see other big-time celebrities doing. Look, I understand there's other marketable people. Peyton Manning, I get it, right? And other likable people. But I'm telling, I'm talking overall greatness, dominance, everything. Like, Shaquille O'Neal encompasses all of that. And Anytime he has a cameo in a movie or a TV show, it's hilarious. Like, he really is just, Shaquille's one of a kind. By and, I, and I really do think he's, I'm going to say, can I give more props? I'm going to say Shaquille's our national treasure. Gives back to everybody, like Rich said, but also is part of all these giant brands He's invested in Lyft, JCPenney, Gold Bond, Icy Hot, the General Insurance, Forever 21, Reebok, Barney's, the Shaq brand, Ring, Vitamin Water, Google, Pepsi, Apple, Tap Out, Esports. And I think he even had a, he's involved in Krispy Kreme. Like, he owns so many different businesses and, and franchises. It's ridiculous. And Papa John's, too, doesn't he? So many different brands that we don't even know about. We're like, here we are giving credit to the same people all the time. It's like, this guy should be number one forefront in the conversation. He should be what other young athletes emulate. Like, hey, if I have some success, I want to give back the way Shaq does. I want to invest the way Shaq does. 
And I just want to be a good person to people that need it the way Shaq does. So this is our stroking uh, Shaq segment of the day. Well, when you, <laughs> but you, when know you what? factor I, in everything, when you factor in everything, overall overall greatness goes to Shaq. Are we have to mark Nick Cope. I mean, you're, you're a guy that knows his stuff. Is, is it fair to say Shaq's a, a, a winning in life type of fella? He definitely is. I, I was thinking about this, and I thought Roger Federer could certainly be up there. He A lot of the benchmarks you guys are checking off for Shaq apply to Federer, both in his philanthropy. And wow. you're talking about you know, Shaq is probably pretty recognizable worldwide, but yeah. Roger Federer on, on a global scale is also one yeah, of the most forget famous world, worldwide, athletes yeah. as well. So uh, just my two cents on someone who came to mind for no, me. No, I'm glad that's why we we're bringing this up because I don't think people think about it that much, and I never thought about Roger Federer that way, so it's good I to I mean, hear. that guy hasn't really played much tennis in the last few years, and he's still has all these endorsements with all these various companies because he is just synonymous with tennis. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. It's, it's amazing how some people – Play the game, and that's it. And then there's other people that are like, nah, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to do a lot more. And Shaq's and yet, that and guy. Yet Shaq is still so involved. He's uh, still very much the face of everything that's going on. The, the oh, amount of publicity that that L.A. got when Jerry West got that trade for Shaq from Orlando, that was like everything for the it Lakers. Wild it was unbelievable, here. Dan. Oh, Remember when man. they traded for oh, Shaq? Yeah. I mean, Jerry West literally... No one thought that Jerry West was going to get Shaquille you know, to come play for the Lakers, and he did. So it was amazing. What a time to go to Staple. Well, at the time, the Great Western Forum when he first started out here. But to watch those two uh, build their chemistry together, I was, I was a kid watching them and trying to save my money at my part-time radio job to get in to the forum to watch those two do their thing. It was a great time for basketball in L.A. The one thing that... I take away from Shaq and watching that documentary recently. Mm -hmm. He's such a big kid. He's like forever young. And so we watch some of our heroes and they're all kind of like on the same timeline as us, like LeBron. And you watch them kind of get older and it makes you feel old in a way. But with Shaq, except for that little bit of gray in his goatee, he yeah, should next, probably next color. In, next endorsement should be just for men. <laughs> yes. Hey, Shaq, get yo, go, 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 go. I, took 10 <laughs> years, I took 10 years off my life. I started down my my beard. He should color that, though. I look at him as one of those dudes where he's going to be a big kid the whole time he's here on Earth. Yeah. No, I, I love And I love that about him, man. I do. Um, and I think he references something about the the goat in that rap he does with Machine Gun Kelly in his remix. So it, it sparked that thought. And, of course, there's a lot of other people that could be in that conversation, like I said, uh, Peyton Manning or Federer. But I think Shaq gets lost in that mix because we don't think of him as the goat in basketball because it's always LeBron – and Jordan. And he played beside and Kobe. He, and he who, played beside Kobe, who, but when you factor you know, in everything, he's probably the answer, or one of the answers for sure. Yeah. Until the, until the whole, you know, alleged murder thing. OJ could have been on that list, too. But OJ, <laughs> uh, he, I mean, he was in movies. and yep. uh, I mean, that's know, a big... Uh, everyone loved OJ. That's and a then big he, what no, if. But then the what... You know, just I'm throwing it out there. All right, uh, your phone calls and feedback.